And welcome back to the Exxon, everyone. I am Rob McConnell, and for the next four hours, I'm your host, I'm your guide, as together we cross this time-space continuum to this place that I call the Exxon. It's a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. It's a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. And the Exxon comes to you Monday through Friday from 10 p.m. Eastern until 2 a.m. Eastern, right here on the Exxon Broadcast Network, Talk Star Radio Network, Mutual Broadcast Network, and iHeart Radio. If you'd like to send me an email, it's very simple, exxon at exxonradiotv.com on all social media sites, Exxon Radio TV. And if you'd like to see the programming we have available for you 24-7, 365 on the Exxon Broadcast Network, visit www.xzbn.net. My guest this hour, Exxon Nation, is a gentleman we've had the pleasure of having on the show many times before. His name is Joshua Shapiro. And uh, Joshua has been involved with Crystal Skulls since 1983 when he saw one made of out of amethyst in Northern California. The name of this Crystal Skull is Amy. He felt such a strong connection with this artifact that since that time he has devoted his life and resources to sharing the best information he can about these crystalline artifacts with other people all over the world. Joining me now is Joshua Shapiro. And Joshua, welcome back to the Exxon. Always great having you with us. Thank you so much, Rob. A pleasure to be here again. Uh, Joshua, you, in my opinion, are one of the top authorities when it comes to the crystal skulls. You and I have talked many times over the years about these magnificent artifacts. And over the years, you, you have done so much. You have gone to many places. You have spoken to many people about these these mysterious artifacts, and what have you learned over the years that you can share with our listeners? Well, I, I think I need to go back to day one of being a crystal skull explorer, as I call myself, when I met this crystal skull, Ami, that you mentioned in the intro, the Amtha skull, because I received a message when I saw that crystal skull, first a picture of it, then in person, mm-hmm. and, and that was in 1983. So what is it, 35 years ago? My now. gosh, yeah. And I think that the message that I received by being in the presence is still very important. And the sensings that I received from being around that crystal skull, of course, it's been amplified many, many times over over the years, was that these skulls have... And I know uh, when I was on the Sci-Fi Channel, they they did a – not the Sci-Fi Channel. There was a, a group for the Smithsonian mm-hmm. that we discussed this on the documentary they did. And it's very difficult to prove. But, I, you know, you asked me, what do I think? What's yes. my experience been? Yep. And, and I, I really believe that there is some kind of living intelligence or consciousness – that is connected to these artifacts, which communicates with people telepathically. I'm not the only one. I've spoken to many people who I consider to be crystal skull guardians. So if that indeed is possibly true, the message which this amethyst skull gave me, called to me, was we are returning to help humanity to create world peace. And that was the essence of what I felt when I was around it. So I, I kind of agree with... Uh, some of the indigenous people that mm-hmm. I've met, the shamans, the elders, who also are familiar with the crystal skulls, especially the Mayans, and they talk about them as being sacred objects. And I I have a memory, although, you know, when you have these past life memories, how can we prove it? But I have a memory of working with them in Atlantis, like a priest in the temples. And I just think that advanced civilizations in the past worked with them they may be like computers they may have programmed them with incredible knowledge and information with healing energy and this is part of the reason why i think it's very important as they're coming back now of course as we've talked about before there are crystal skulls being carved by modern carvers and there's a big debate over whether there's any significance to that versus some that have been found around or close to ancient ruins like in Mexico and right. Central America, etc. Well, you know, it's, so, it's funny when, when, when people talk about the crystal skulls that, that modern-day artisans and sculptures have created. You know, they, they look at it with a, with a negative slant, but yet if somebody does a crucifix, you know, they're, they're said, well, that's good because what they're doing is they're, 
they look at it this uh, through a positive aspect. So I, you know, I don't understand why the negativity with one and the positive feelings about the other, especially since the crystal skulls have a much longer historical presence than Christianity does. Definitely. I think the main challenge that comes up, let's say if you're having a conversation between a person who is followed, following a spiritual mm-hmm. path versus a religious path, is from the religious point of view, they look at the skull. Now, this is what doesn't make sense to me. The skull is being something that represents death and doom. Perhaps because if you see a bone skull of a person who was alive and now they're dead, there's a great fear of death. Although I think this is changing because there are so many people now that are having uh, either an out-of-body experience, a near-death experience. They're talking about things, uh, communications through mediums, talking with spirit on the other side. So to a religious person, the connotation is more dark with that. But that doesn't make any sense because that is an important part of every human being's body, the skull. Exactly. And if, you know, and if there was a higher intelligence that decided to create the form of humanity, whether you want to call it galactics or angels or God or, you know, I mean, this is one of the great mysteries that we have. Where mm-hmm. did humanity come from? How do we get to shape this body? Was it evolution or was there some intelligent beings that, that got involved in this and, and helped in it? I can't believe that the shape of the skull is the only part of the human body which is death, doom, and evil, and the rest of it is okay. The, the skull houses our brain, which allows us to have communication, you know, to communicate with yeah. each other, but also... I believe there's parts of the brain we don't understand that's receiving, I don't know, other cosmic knowledge and information, if you will. So the brain is a very important part of who we are, and the, the skull protects it, and it's part of who we are. So I, I've always seen the crystal skulls, even from day one, as always being a very powerful and positive thing for humanity. And it, like you said, you know, I've worked very hard and tried to provide for people the best information and let them decide, you know, what do you think, how do you feel about it. But really the key is you have to have a personal experience with one. And once you do, then things start to change for you immediately. You know, uh, crystals have been used in radio communications, uh, you know, from the very start. You know, when we used to have the crystal radio sets that that got me going in radio many years ago. Uh, As a child, you know, it, it brings in information. It's a very important part of any radio system. Mm -hmm. So why is it, why do people find it so implausible that the information that you are sharing where this, it could be, or is a, a form or a a piece of, 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 let's say equipment for lack of better word at this time, that is bringing in information and all we need to really do is have the same type of experience that you and other people have had, drop the bias and say, you know what? It is possible. Yes, definitely. Uh, And all of my experiences around crystals has been, I feel like I'm enhanced. Mm -hmm. It's like there's an energy connected with the crystal, which has a symbiotic relationship with the energy of a human being. I think Marcel Vogel, before he passed away, he was doing a lot of research. He had a center in San Jose, California, and this was one of the areas that he was looking at, is what was the relationship between the effect of a quartz crystal upon a human being. And he found that there was some uh, symbiotic energy that, you know, if a person really understands and is open to it and starts to work with crystals, whether it's in the shape of a skull or just a crystal, it is enhancing a person. A lot of times what I've done, as you know, I've written a number of books, is I'll take one of my crystal skulls and I'll just put them like kind of by the computer as I'm typing. Mm-hmm. And it just seems to give me more clarity of mind and it's easier for me to write. The words are just coming out very easily. And, um, you know, so this is one of the things that crystal skulls have helped me with, I guess, my creativity or, you know, a lot of people will say, you know, Joshua, when you're in your house, you're so quiet but then put you up on a stage and start sharing about these things you love and the crystal skulls are around and you become almost like an actor and you're animated. So that's been the effect uh, the skulls have had on me. It just amplifies my gifts and 
and animates me and links me into things sometimes I don't even know. And all of a sudden, I just have a, a clarity and understanding about something, and, and I share it with people, and it makes a lot of sense. So I really like crystals. I think they're one of the most powerful right. tools that we have right now, besides the fact that all of our technology is based upon quartz. All right, crystals. let's hold it right there, Joshua. You and I have to take our first break. Exxon Nation, Joshua Shapiro is my special guest, a good friend of the Exxon. His website is cse.crystalskullexplorers. Dot com. I'm Rob McConnell. This is the Exxon. We'll be back on the other side of this break as we continue from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere. 24-7-365. You have heard of the X-Zone? Now watch it on Simo TV plus 500 video games, live TV channels, free video on demand, worldwide, and more. Does this sound like tomorrow's television? Well, it is, but you can have it today, right now. It is Simul TV. Simul TV offers what the others only wish they could provide. 15 exclusive channels like X-Zone, Sci-Fi, and Horror. We are worldwide. No other provider offers that. 500 built-in video games. No need to have an extra expensive system. We have them included. Free video on demand. Live streaming events from around the world. Interactive online network and much more. Tomorrow's TV today. Simul TV. Sound too good to be true? Well, it's not. You can have Simul TV today. Sign up at simultv.com. Do it today. We live in rapidly shifting times of extreme volatility and uncertainty. Such profound change brings a unique opportunity for the evolution of consciousness. I'm Gwilda Wiecka, host of Mission Evolution Radio Show, a program that explores the latest scientific developments and deepening spiritual truths supporting human evolution. Join me on xzbn.net, where I interview leading experts in science, physics, medicine, spirituality, and more. By applying divergent viewpoints to leading-edge topics, we uncover expansive and evolutionary truth to assist you on your path to enlightenment. More information and past episodes are available at missionevolution.org. Welcome back, everyone. My guest this hour is Joshua Shapiro. And as I said uh, during the first segment of the show, in my opinion, he is one of the leading world authorities when it comes to the crystal skulls. And he has had the opportunity that I wish I had in having a personal experience with a crystal skull. And the experience that Joshua had in his early days has led him to many places around the world talking to many people getting the message out to the masses about the Crystal Skulls. His website is cse.crystalskullexplorers.com. Joshua, thanks so much for coming back. What was it like that that very first time that you had your experience with Ami? Well, the first time I had really contact with Ami, it was through a picture of it. I had a friend who actually, I guess, had the skull in her home Mm -hmm for a couple of days and then she was allowed to take pictures 
So I went to her store because I was sharing with her uh, copies of my first book, Journeys of an Aquarian Age Networker, which I did back in the early 1980s. And then she pulled out this picture of of the skull, and I had a, um, I call it an energetic response to it. I actually felt um, vibration inside. I called it an inner earthquake. And then while we were looking at the picture, there was a real earthquake in California because oh this was in San Jose. So that got my interest and, in, you know, I'm an Aries. So if I see something that's different or mm-hmm. unique or, you know, it's an experience I can have that I've never had before, then I'm going to inquire. So I said, is there any chance I could actually see the real skull? And then about two weeks later, three weeks later, some person was coming through San Jose. He claimed to be quite wealthy. The people who had the skull at this time, they were owners of an art gallery. They wanted to sell this artifact. So uh, because I was connected to this uh, woman who was the owner of the store, I got invited to go and actually see the crystal skull. And um, basically what happened to me was is I was allowed to touch it. And as I was touching it, I felt, I would say, an energy. It was with my right hand on the top of the skull. An energy came from the skull up through my hand, through my arm, to my shoulder. And then, although one of my inner gifts is not inner vision, in my mind's eye, ever since that day, I always see that skull kind of floating over my right shoulder, as if I somehow connected with it, and my spirit or my soul is connected with it. And then uh, the, the next time I got to see that skull, Uh, We were able to arrange with the owners of the skull, and I think this was in the early 2000, like 2001 or 2002. Um, We went to San Jose, and they actually allowed us to bring a device called a Meridian Stress Test System, which I don't know if all your listeners know about it, but it's a really powerful machine. And we were testing people because it measures the um, vibration in the meridians in the hands and the feet, We were able to see what effect that crystal skull was having upon people that we tested it with. But for me, the most important experience with it was I got to sleep with it. It was next to my head. Mm -hmm. And I also put one of my personal skulls, Portal de Luz, which is our large smoky quartz skull done by a Brazilian carver that I've had for many years. And then I actually got to do meditation with both skulls. I have a picture of that somewhere. And that was a really powerful uh, meditation. So this is how I got to know this skull. This was, you know, some of the effects that it had upon me. But it's one of my favorite ones because really it's the one that activated me to my search to want to know more. And and I've never stopped and I probably never will stop until the day I pass on to spirit. What, what, What kind of dreams did you have the night that you actually slept with the crystal skull? Well, I'm not really a good person to talk to about dreams, Rob, because I don't have too many. Okay. And I don't remember having a dream. I just kind of felt like, I think what I recall is when I went to sleep and I woke up, it felt as if almost no time had passed. So it wasn't so much I had mm-hmm. a dream. I don't know if it, if I had such a restful sleep that time went by or or being in the presence of my own skull with that skull, I went way, way out. You know, I believe we leave our body. I could have gone into some other dimensions. Um, But uh, what's interesting is um, when I was in Peru, now this is where I'm looking for the blue skull in Peru, Mm -hmm. which is a whole other story. And I'm redoing that book right now. I'm updating it. I did actually have a dream when we were close to the area high up in the Andes Mountains where I'm looking for this crystal skull. And I remember I had a dream where there was a blue skull that showed up in my dream, but it wasn't the one I was looking for. I just knew it was a skull that was blue. And I put that in this book, you know, search for the blue skull. And there was a lady on the East Coast. I think it was in, I don't know if she was in Connecticut or Maine, somewhere up there. Uh, read the book, and she felt she had to send us a blue crystal skull that she had in her uh, uh, that she had that she had actually purchased. And it came right around my birthday a few years ago, and that was a lapis lazuli skull. So that was connected kind of to a dream, um, but mostly I don't, uh, my dreams aren't that affected by the skulls. How many skulls have been found to date? 
Well, I don't think anybody really knows how many have been found because what happened is in, when I first started in the early 1980s, there were only a handful of crystal skulls that were known, right. like the one in the British Museum, the Paris Mitchell Hedges. But what's happening now is there are many skulls that are not only coming out of Mexico and Central America that are being found. And in Mexico, people were telling me literally they were kicking the ground and a skull would roll out of it. But also there's a whole different type of skulls that are coming out of like Tibet and China, which don't look human-like at all. They're like stylized skulls mm -hmm. made out of every gemstone that you can imagine. They have very strange shape. We actually now have two skulls that are like that. And uh, their energy is very much different than a lot of the other crystal skulls that I've seen. So I would, I would have to say now there are hundreds or thousands of skulls that are coming out. And according to the message I received from Ami, it was like Ami was preparing me like his brothers and sisters – are all going to just start coming out, you know, like in the future. So now we're 35 years later, whereas the time when I saw me, there were not so many. Now there are hundreds or thousands of them. And then, of course, you know, all the experts are saying, well, these are modern skulls, so they're fake. And even the skull in the British Museum, they're calling a fake. So it's, it's really hard to try to find... Um, kind of a marriage between researching something from the paranormal and researching something from the scientific and trying to find the bridge that connects those two. So we don't really have that many scientists that are interested in finding out why do these skulls have this energy and why are they having such a power effect of, upon people. Um, so, you know, but I'm hopeful in the future that, you know, I'll meet some scientists who may be intrigued by this and that we can actually do some, you know, real true tests, like working with the Meridian Stress Test System, which is a very good system for diagnosing people what's wrong and going on in their body by measuring the meridian energy. It also seemed to also measure the energetic effect of the skulls on people. And it was pretty amazing, you know, the numbers that I was coming up with. I tried to share this with the sci-fi channel because they interviewed me for their you know tv documentary they mm -hmm. did when the indiana jones film last one came out but they didn't use it in the documentary probably because they couldn't understand what i was trying to explain to them from the results but it's very interesting how if a crystal skull is around a person it does impact how they're doing energetically and you know feeling and health wise so but this should be researched scientifically more. I think it would be amazing what we could learn from that. 35 years later, Joshua, do you have any idea where these skulls come from? Well, I have, of course, my own theories. Um, definitely, I would have to say the extraterrestrials are involved in bringing them here. Mm -hmm. Now, why do I say that? Well, Number one, there are a few crystal skulls that do not look human-like. They look more alien-like. But the other thing that has come up uh, with some testing that has been done is uh, sometimes under the right conditions, holographic images can be recorded within the skulls, mm -hmm. like when they're doing research. Right. And images of extraterrestrials and UFOs came up. Now... What I do not know is, is that showing the origin of where they may be coming from, or is that showing the skulls are working like a video camera that recorded around it in its presence in the past that the Earth was visited by extraterrestrials and spaceship? So I don't know what the answer about that is. But I, I, my, if I go with my intuition, I think that humanity was gifted with these long ago to help us in our spiritual evolution. Another theory that came up in our first book that I did with Nasserino and Bohm, Mystery of the Crystal Skulls Revealed, was the possibility – now this gets into the hollow earth, which again is another controversial subject. But I think there's um, you know, shots from space that show that there's an opening at the north and the south pole and light is coming out of it and that explains the aurora borealis that um, he was claiming – that the people who live on the inside of the Earth, with if the Earth is hollow, gravity holding on the inner surface, they have their own crystal skulls as well. So it may be possible, if this is true, that maybe not the galactics brought the skulls, but these 
tall beings that maybe they're descendants from Lemuria and Atlantis that are living inside the Earth. They had their own skull, and a few of those snuck out onto the surface of the planet. That's well, hold, hold on, Josh. Well, we've got to take our break. We'll be back on the other side, Exxon Nation. Please don't go away. From our broadcast studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, to the world and beyond, you're watching the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. ABS Media. Day. You have heard of the X Zone? Now watch it on Simo TV, plus 500 video games, live TV channels, free video on demand, worldwide, and more. Does this sound like tomorrow's television? Well, it is, but you can have it today, right now. It is Simo TV. Simo TV offers what the others only wish they could provide. 15 exclusive channels like X-Zone, Sci-Fi, and Horror. We are worldwide. No other provider offers that. 500 built-in video games. No need to have an extra expensive system. We have them included. Free video on demand. Live streaming events from around the world. Interactive online network and much more. Tomorrow's TV today. Simul TV. Sound too good to be true? Well, it's not. You can have Simul TV today. Sign up at simultv.com. Do it today. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi Fi, you can still listen to the X Zone radio show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X Minus One? Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember, 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. Rob McConnell here, presenting an overview for Nicholas Paul Jinnix, author of a fascinating book, Amen. It presents facts revealed by Egyptologists, facts that enable us to understand why Amen is the beginning of creation of God. It provides recommendations for religious leaders of the major religions to unify their beliefs and teach the word of God, love one another. Amen informs people how mankind conceived God. It was the Egyptians that developed the concepts of a soul, a hereafter, and son of God, and finally, after the worship of many gods, they conceived the belief in one universal God, the maker of all there is. For more information, visit www.futureofgodamen.com. That's www.futureofgodamen.com. Joshua Shapiro is my special guest this hour, www.cse.crystalskullexplorers.com. Joshua, is it possible that the people who gifted this planet with the crystal skulls fashioned the, the, the skull and its mystery in, in the shape of a human skull so that we would pay attention to it instead of just using some other, some other form, uh, some other way of presenting this skull to us? Is it possible that they knew that one day the all the dots would connect and that the true meaning of the crystal skulls, their importance to humanity and to the world would be would be known and shared? I think you're absolutely right, Rob, that the shape like a human bone skull, mm -hmm. it makes a lot of sense because I've actually had experiences where sometimes we, we have our crystal skulls out in the public and if it was, you know, just a regular piece of crystal in a strange shape, people could walk by you and they wouldn't pay any attention. Right. But when somebody walks by us and they see the skulls, sometimes they just point and they walk away. 
or like one time when I was going through, um, I, I was in England and I was coming back and I went through, you know, the x-ray machine. They're able, apparently, the x-ray machines are so sophisticated now. This guy in London that was looking at my skull mm-hmm. through the bag, he personally wanted to see it because he had seen the Indiana Jones film and he thought maybe it's fantasy. Maybe oh, wow. they don't exist. And so he asked me to take it out for him. So, um yeah, so I think the shape is is very important, and it's what causes people to be curious. Now, like I said before, I remember in the early days where we didn't have digital photographs, we mm-hmm. had to go to the store and get our pictures developed, and I would take pictures of skulls, and, and the people there would look at it and go, "What are you doing with that? It's you know so dark and and everything." But um, I definitely feel it, it's the shape of it, and also I believe that. The shape of our bone skull was intentionally done this way so that we could receive cosmic knowledge and information. So if it's true that the shape of our bone skull is Mm -hmm. able to do this and they're making a crystal skull and crystal already is able to receive and send all kinds of different frequencies of energy and putting that into the shape, then these crystal skulls become these very powerful objects that can be tools to assist humanity. So I definitely think that its shape is is important. Joshua, earlier you were saying that you went down to uh, to South America to to uh, to look for, I believe, it was the blue crystal skull. Yes. Why South America? Why have the majority of the crystal skulls and the research that have gone into seeking the crystal skulls, along with explorers like yourself? Why is everything focused on South America? Why do you think? that that those who created the crystal skull who had obviously far more intelligence than we have right now why would they choose south america instead of let's say heartland usa the prairies of canada stonehenge why Mm -hmm. south america well the only way I can answer it is a vision I had when I was in Peru when I was looking for this blue skull. But first, let me define what it is because it's a very strange circumstance that I'm in. Okay. I'm looking for a crystal skull that I have a vision of very clear, and I see it around me mm-hmm. in my mind's eye all the time. But that means it's not in the physical reality. So essentially, I'm looking for a crystal skull that I don't know either I'm imagining it or it's fantasy, or it exists on some other dimension and is communicating with me, and it it will decide, because it seems to be a very conscious being to itself, whether it's going to come out or not. But while I was on my first trip going to Peru, intentionally looking for this, I'm wanting to meet it in person, Mm -hmm. I still have not done that. I still only see it in vision. I had a vision when I was meditating with my uh, smoky quartz skull, Portal de Luz, of Atlantis, that when Atlantis was, right before it was going to be destroyed, Atlantis had these colonies all over the planet. And South America definitely was one of the places where it had colonies, as well as probably in Mexico too, and maybe even some parts of the U.S. And what I recall from the vision was being with some other people from Atlantis. Atlantis is on the verge of sinking under the water, And we are taking sacred objects from Atlantis to South America because we know that South America, for the most part, will be untouched, let's let's say, by the modern world. And this is quite true. If you travel throughout South America, there is a large part of South America which is like nature and jungles, and there's no civilization around there whatsoever. And so I think that the Atlanteans knew that these artifacts would be protected. They took them to their colonies in South America, and they just said, you know, when it's the right time they could see in the future for humanity, there would be a time where we would have a technology similar to Atlantis, which I believe now is this time, and that we would have many challenges. You know, we have wars going on, country against country, technology being used, Mm -hmm. many people in poverty, uh, some diseases. You know, we have a lot of challenges going on right now. We sure do. They had this sensing that these artifacts would be necessary for the future of humanity. Now, let me take that a step further. What if I indeed was on that 
anti-gravity craft that went from Atlantis to South America, mm -hmm. helped to bring those artifacts there. Then I reincarnate now, and now these artifacts are needed to help humanity. Would not the skull, if I was connected to the, this blue skull, which is what I believe, be calling to me? Be saying, it's coming time now for me to come out. I want you to write a book. Even though I'm not physically out, I still want you to write about all the things that happened to you when you were in South America. I went there three times looking for it. And each trip, uh, different things happen. But I was very smart because when you go to Peru, you're in a higher vibrational state. And if you try to remember everything that happened to you on the trip, you won't do it. So I brought a little computer with me, and every day I just typed everything that was going on and that happened to me. Whether it was important or not, I just recorded everything. And now I'm actually going back through that book to update it right now because it's linked to the new novel we just came out with. The Blue Skull shows up in our novel. And um, so I want those two books to be linked so that if a person reads the novel and says, oh, this Blue Skull, that's interesting. Oh, wait, Joshua has this book where he talks about looking for it and all the things that came to him. So that's why I think South America is uh, such an important part is the Atlanteans knew it would be untouched and they brought a lot of their artifacts there. And I believe coming up maybe within the next 20, 15, 20 years, these artifacts will show themselves and definitely help humanity. I've heard a lot of stories about Atlantis, the Atlanteans, the theories behind where this this mythical land was. And there's a lot of speculation by a lot of different scholars, researchers, explorers. And the information that I've been able to gather from everyone that I've had the experience to talk to is that the Atlanteans were very smart. They were very futuristic. How come they couldn't save themselves? Well, this is what Edgar Cayce said, and I think his explanation is the best one I've heard. Mm -hmm. He said that, and I have a book also I found in a library by Seattle that also kind of supports this, that there were different periods of time in Atlantis where actually they had utopia, where religion and science and spirituality all worked together. But what happened in the later parts of Atlantis is there were two factions. There was a scientific faction that only cared about the physical reality and had no interest whatsoever in spirituality at all, which we could say this is kind of how it is for a lot of people right now. Sure and then there like was it. another group of people mm -hmm. who were very spiritual and, and worked with the, the priest. And in the book that I received, it talked about that there was another group of about 40 or 44 priests and they would meet and they would um, record sacred wisdom and knowledge and they would be teachers for their people and everything. So I think what happened at the end of Atlantis is the two factions start fighting with each other. And the spiritual group had the visions, Atlantis is going under, we better take our sacred objects and our records and everything mm -hmm. and we better put them in secure places and that's what I felt is that I was a part of that group and then the island sank and they're kind of kind of a lot of the Atlanteans are reincarnating now so we do it right this time instead of destroying our planet or our country or mm -hmm. whatever creating a third world war you know it's time now for peace to happen and that's always been the message that I feel is representative of the crystal skulls that they have returned to help us to create world peace. Joshua, you and I have to take our final break for this segment. Please stand by. Exonation. Nation, if you'd like to find out more about Joshua, if you'd like to get any of his books, read his his website. It's 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 in depth. Spend some time there. Let it sink in. Go back. Read it again. Read his books. A lot of work, a lot of thought, and a lot of what's the word here? A lot of hypothesis that makes a lot of sense went into his books as well. Visit his website, cse.crystalskullexplorers.com. We'll both be back as we wrap up this hour here in the X-Zone from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. My name is Rob McConnell. Don't go away.
You have heard of the X Zone? Now watch it on Simo TV, plus 500 video games, live TV channels, free video on demand, worldwide, and more. Does this sound like tomorrow's television? Well, it is, but you can have it today, right now. It is Simul TV. Simul TV offers what the others only wish they could provide 15 exclusive channels like X Zone, Sci Fi, and Horror. We are worldwide. No other provider offers that. 500 built in video games. No need to have an extra expensive system. We have them included. Free video on demand. Live streaming events from around the world. Interactive online network and much more. Tomorrow's TV today. Simul TV. Sound too good to be true? Well, it's not. You can have Simul TV today. Sign up at simultv.com. Do it today. The new nonfiction book, Razor of Madness, is similar to cult movies like Clockwork Orange, Dragon's Tattoo, or The Other Side of Hell. Wayne Morin Jr. and Thomas Lee Howe will expose widespread and systematic deficiencies in this thought provoking tell all novel. Mind control rages among scholars in law schools. Human rights are ignored while thought reform and mental manipulation are accepted practices used as behavior modification. Dr. Louis Jolion West comes to mind. Media and public scrutiny shows that United States mental hospitals are, in fact, destructive murder industries. Razor of Madness Expose Novel details this epidemic through an in depth professional and personal investigation. For decades, there has been a revolving door policy that still releases killers and pedophiles back into society. The maestro of mind control continues to haunt America to this very day. Razor of Madness is available in paperback or as a downloadable ebook at Amazon.com. The concept of a new age has been around since the late 19th century, yet much of its original meaning has been lost. What exactly is the new age? Is it a religion, a collection of obscure esoteric practices, a series of doomsday predictions, or an astrological event? The New Age Chronicles is a unique, complementary publication bringing reason and grounded information to separate fact from fiction. Chuck full of valuable information to support you as we make the monumental shift into the new era. You won't want to miss a single innovative issue. The New Age Chronicles newspaper is coming soon to www.newagechronicles.com. Welcome back, everyone. An appropriate song for this hour. Of course, that's Atlantis by Donovan. And our guest this hour is talking about Crystal Skulls. We've talked about Atlantis. His name is Joshua Shapiro. His website is csc.crystalskullexplorers.com. As always, Joshua, thanks so much for coming on the show. Great pleasure having you with us. And and where do you think Atlantis is? Well, originally, I believe what Casey said, that it was in the um, Atlantic Ocean. Mm-hmm that it went through uh, different periods where it was a huge continent, then it broke into three islands, then it was one island, then it was gone. But recently, there's a lot of information coming out of Antarctica that I think is very interesting. Besides the fact they say there are pyramids there and there's things buried underneath the ice, there are some people who are starting to think that Atlantis may actually have begun there, which means that the Antarctic was at one time not in an area which, which was frozen. It mm-hmm. had, you know, a subtropical climate, which would um, support, I guess, that the the Earth's axis is shift periodically. So I think there's some tie between Ant- Antarctica and these islands in the Atlantic. Why do you think it was Plato who brought forth the information about Atlantis and no one else? Well, I would guess that the Greeks Mm -hmm. uh, were probably a colony of Atlantis at one time, and they probably stored some records from the Atlanteans that they, you know, just had secretly, and possibly Plato had access to those records. Has there ever been any evidence found of of Atlantis? 
Uh, I think the major evidence of Atlantis comes from near the Bimini Islands. They found some structures under the water. Right, the Bimini Wall, are, right? Right. Yeah. And then the other thing I think which is uh, part of Atlantis, which I've actually held one time, is what was called Dr. Brown's Atlantean Crystal Ball. That was the most amazing artifact. I felt very honored that the ball literally was placed in my right hand. Mm-hmm. And... Um, it's still there, you know. Wow. The essence of it is still there, but the ball itself uh, exploded when it was taken to Mount Shasta, so it doesn't exist anymore. It's in pieces, so which is a shame because that. But there was a difference between the Atlantean ball and the crystal skulls I work with. You know, they're both quartz crystal. Yeah. The crystal skulls seem to have a living consciousness inside of them. And the ball seemed to have a program uh, intelligence, you know, because I work with computers. Mm-hmm. I'm used to inter interfacing with an artificial intelligence through the computer that's been programmed by people who've created the operating system. My sensing was is that the ball responded automatically to the vibrational essence of the person who's who, who was holding it or working with it, but it wasn't like the skulls where you're talking to something that's alive. You're having a conversation with something working through the skull that's alive. So that was the difference for me. How much harm was caused when Mitchell Hedges, um, you know, called his skull the crystal skull of doom? Was that a big PR screw up? Well, obviously, I don't agree with him having have had several experiences with that skull. Right. Um, it could it could have been you know just to get attention. I don't know. I don't like to try to speculate okay. why other people do what they do. No, but I guess but, what I was trying to get at, Joshua, if mm-hmm. if Mitchell Hedges would have put a, a positive connotation on the skull, let's say the the skull of ancient knowledge. Would that have been a greater asset to the exploration, the research, and the looking for crystal skulls instead of it having a negative connotation, which it still does today with many people, because you and I discussed that earlier? Right. I think that would have been a better way to to look at it, definitely, because that's the way that I see the skull. That's My experiences are based on it, but... You know, everything happens for its reason and purpose. I think also, too, when that skull came out in the 1920s, people were not really ready for it. They didn't understand what it was. They weren't ready for it. There wasn't this great interest. Really, the interest in the crystal skulls doesn't truly begin until the 1970s when um, the first book comes out. And then they have TV shows about it. And then the Mitchell Hedges skull is shown on... um, uh, mysterious World, Arthur C. Clarke. Yeah. So, so really in the 70s, that's when it, it started taking off. And then in the 80s, uh, it came back, and then all of a sudden modern carvers are starting to make them, and it's never stopped since then. So it could be that name was given because it was an artifact that came out that people didn't understand. And, um, you know, again, I think the Mayans, they understood it was a sacred artifact. But why would they gift it if that story's correct? You know, people challenge mm-hmm. the story, how it was discovered. The bottom line for me is it doesn't matter how it was discovered. The key is that it has impacted positively and still impacts positively many, many people. Because we brought uh, Bill Holman, the current guardian, to Seattle in 2016. And, you know, I just kept watching each person as they came out of the session. They were – their eyes were lit up. They were like in heaven – um, and then they wrote to us afterwards about positive change happening to them after that. So I think it's really important. Do we have a quick moment at all, Rob, to get into the new novel, which oh, focuses on Oh, please do. Skull? Sure. Let's go. That's, good. That's a great idea. Okay. So um, I'm very proud. Well, you know, as an author, I'm always proud when I get a chance that I can bring a book out. But in January, we came out with a new book, and it was done as a team effort. Karen uh, Tucker in England is a novelist. I am not a novelist. I needed some assistance. I just had this story that came to me in 2014, which was linked to the Crystal Skulls. 
But the whole idea of the novel, and it's called Journeys into the Unknown and Back Again, is it's kind of like you know an explorer type. And I, and I will admit to you, Rob, I put a lot of my experiences into the story for the main character. Right. But um, you know he he's out there just like I am, and he's researching crystal skulls and UFOs and all the paranormal and everything. And all of a sudden, he starts to have a sequence of events that happen to him that show him that he has to take a trip to Peru. He's being invited to go through a dimensional door to the other side in order to um, not only experience it, but um, the spirits on this side, the living beings that live in these dimensions, they figure out, and I'm not going to tell your listeners how this came to me, but it's a perfect solution. They figured out how he could record everything that happens to him in these other dimensions. And he would be able, when he came back, to start showing like 3D holographic video to people exactly what happens to him. Who, who he meets on the other side and the conversations, the places he visits and everything. So this is a very difficult book to write because, you know, uh, most of us have maybe some idea or maybe we've seen some movie about what could the uh, life be on the other side? Mm -hmm. Where do people go when it's our time to leave here and all right. of that? And um, But we're, we're in book two. Book one basically introduced the character. That's what came out in January. People can find it on our website. They can go on Amazon. It's there on Amazon now. Um, they get to meet the characters, and so the first book ends as our main character, our explorer type, is about to walk through the dimensional door high up in the Andes Mountains that he's been guided to, and book two starts when he goes through this dimensional door, what he sees on the other side. So part of the reason for my doing a novel is because, you know, a, a lot of people, if you give them a book and say, okay, these are my real-life experiences – you know, if they're religious or scientific yeah. or whatever, they're not going to want to read your book. But people are very open to fantasy stories. So I'm taking, I guess, uh, literary uh, uh, liberties to try to put in there as many things as I believe is actually true that's been going on on the planet. You know, different phenomena, different activities. Uh, crystal skulls are, of course, involved. And the blue skull shows up. Because he can't go through the dimension. Josh, well, I hate to do this, it. my friend, but the time is up when you and I must say so long for tonight. But continued success and exonation, please visit Joshua's website, www.csc.crystalskullexplorers.com. I'll be back on the other side of this break as we continue here in the Exxon from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away. Modern Esoteric, Beyond Our Senses by Brad Olson, consummates the lifeology story about where humanity originates. It is the lost continents, the primitive wisdom, the mythos of creation, and the rethinking of ancient history as we are taught in academia. There is much more to the story than what we have been told. As this is the first book in the Esoteric series, Modern Esoteric starts at the beginning of time and accelerates up to this modern age. Future Esoteric is book two in the series and takes a forward-looking position ahead of today with an open and honest examination of the ET issue and various unexplained phenomena. To discover the writings of author Brad Olson, visit www.bradolson.com. That's www.bradolson.com. Are you or is someone you know struggling with addictions, depression, anxiety, relationships, low self-esteem, lack of confidence, grief, success, and prosperity? Do you know that your subconscious belief plays a big role in the outcome of your hard work? We can help you permanently change the beliefs that may be the reason for your struggles and failures. We care about getting you the return on your investment and the results you are looking for. We can help you be free of the limitations of your past and in realizing your highest potential. We work with people by phone and Skype. 
For more information, visit us at www.ritasoman.com. That's www.ritasoman.com. Do you think you have energy problems in your home? Do you feel better when you're away than when you're home? Joey Korn is a global leader in the world of dowsing who specializes in personal energy clearing and space clearing. He can help you create an ideal energy environment in your home no matter where you live in the world. Learn about his remote spiritual house cleaning services and much more at www.dowsers.com. You can get Joey's book, Dowsing, A Path to Enlightenment, as well as other dowsing books and tools, Kabbalah books, and Walter Russell books. Joey's work is really amazing. Go to dowsers.com right now. That's D-O-W-S-E-R-S dot com or call 1-877-DOWSING. That's 1-877-369-7464.